Hey, everybody. The deadline to get your application in for the spring vintage of Village Global Accelerator is March 1st. Companies that have been through the Accelerator have raised from some of the best venture funds in the world, like A16Z, Lux, Spark, Bessemer, Founders Fund, and many more. Learn more and apply at villageglobal.vc slash accelerator. Hey, everybody. It's Eric Tornberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey, everyone. This is Ben Kaznoka, a partner here at Village Global. And we're really excited today to have Elliot Schmuckler, one of the most talented product and engineering executives in Silicon Valley, on the show today. Elliot has helped build several iconic companies in Silicon Valley like LinkedIn, Wealthfront, and Instacart. Today, we're going to learn some of the key lessons from Elliot's time working on product and engineering initiatives for these companies and discuss how he decided to start his own company, Anomalo, which we at Village Global are really proud to back. Elliot, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. Great to be here. Elliot, you were one of the first pioneers of growth marketing techniques uh, at LinkedIn in 2008. Uh, today, of course, um, growth marketing, growth hacking, these are you know, entire industries of, of, uh, of thought leadership and, and, and people who specialize in these areas. But you helped really develop some of these early techniques. We'd love to start just by hearing your journey in the field of, of growth marketing and, and, and growth hacking. What were some of your initial insights when you were at LinkedIn and how have you seen the sort of canon of thinking around how consumer internet properties grow? How has that sort of thinking evolved over the, in the dozen or so years uh, since you were an early pioneer? Yeah, for sure. And I want to give a, a, a little credit. Thank you for your nice words, Ben. But in truth, when I started at LinkedIn, uh, you know, Reed Hoffman, the founder, had already thought about this idea of viral growth, this idea of really measuring growth and using quantitative methods to help the company grow faster. And so he had hired many people into the company that that had this worldview that wanted to collect data and wanted to use metrics and wanted to use experimentation. And they hadn't fulfilled all of those ideas at the time, but it was actually a pretty inspirational place to learn about growth and to try to synthesize some of the early ideas of how you could grow products like LinkedIn and modern consumer internet products. Uh, and so I'm glad you didn't use the the term growth hacking that much because... I only mentioned it a couple of times. <laughs> yes, only a couple of times. And I realize it's a term that's that's very popular. But, you know, the the key idea of what we did at LinkedIn and what I've done since then is what the industry now will term something like product-led growth. Right. The idea that you're changing or improving or optimizing your product to get it to grow faster. You can, of course, layer in marketing on top of that to give you even faster growth. You can layer in sales on top of that for certain companies to give you even faster growth. But the discipline of growth as I see it is this idea that on the modern internet internet with modern web and mobile products, there's actually a lot that you can do in the product itself to get it to grow faster, uh, irregardless of how you're doing marketing and sales or uh, anything else. So what's an example of a, of a product-led growth initiative in, in that, from an, one, one of the companies you've worked at? Yeah. So, for example, if you make it easier to sign up for a product, right, if you lower the friction from thinking the product is a good idea to actually signing up, uh, you're going to make your product grow faster. And that's an easy one. And what I figured out at LinkedIn is there are actually three categories of things you can do with your product to make it grow faster. One is the first one that I just mentioned, which is reducing friction. Can you make it easier for people that are interested in your product to actually sign up to get value, to take the kind of actions that will keep them engaged with your product? The second one is increasing incentive. You know, can you provide a better reason for people to actually use and continue to use your product? You know, can you find a way to generate more value for them with your product offering? And very often, it's not that you're generating more value through the product in the sense of changing the value that the product provides, 
often it's just better communicating the value that the product will provide so that people have a greater need, a uh, greater desire to adopt your product. And the third one is what I call increasing exposure, uh, which is, can you give users out there on the internet or in your product itself more opportunities to engage and discover your product? And so advertising is a classic way that companies increase exposure of their products, but in the product-led growth work, you might think about something like SEO, right? getting more of your product's content into search engines as a way of increasing exposure. Or you might think about when people are in your product, you know, using in-product promotions, things that pop up and say, hey, you should take this action as a way of increasing exposure of key actions that you might want your users to take to generate growth. What are some of the specific examples of would be from LinkedIn or Wealthfront or Instacart that might be sort of fun surprises for folks that 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 within the product in terms of how it was built led to unexpected growth. So yes, keep making the sign up process easier makes sense. And of course, there's a lot of nuance to how to actually do that with with metrics and so yes. on. Um, so I don't mean to understate that as a the science of that. But I remember, you know, from our, from, and for fo- those who don't know, I, I, I worked at LinkedIn for a couple of years and I remember hearing stories, I think it was before my time about, for example, a sort of progress bar on the profile completion and how, um, you know, showing people that you're only 60% through filling out your profile it makes a big impact on folks completing that task. Or of course, most famously, prob- probably of all of LinkedIn history is the address book upload right. um, to figure out who, who you know, who's already on the site. Are there other examples like that that might be lesser known to folks that made a big difference in the growth of the internet properties you've been involved in, Elliot? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite examples is actually from my Wellfront days, and it it does have to do with folks signing up for Wellfront, but it's a very different take on how we optimized it. So Wellfront, as, as many folks know, is an investment management product. So you don't actually get any value out of it until you deposit money into the product uh, to be managed by Wellfront. And you know, depositing money anywhere, significant amounts of money usually is is pretty cumbersome. It's a pretty high friction thing to do, right? You're moving money between accounts and, and, and that kind of thing. And so, you know, we found that we, we couldn't really easily make it simpler. Uh, there were some limits. Uh, and of course, we continued to try and eventually we did. But one of our biggest wins in the early days was actually making it easier for you to resume the process. We saw in the data that a lot of folks would start the Wellfront signup process and then drop out of it because, you know, they had something else to do. They got distracted or they needed to think about it more or, or it was just too many steps to do in one sitting. And then they would come back or try to come back to finish it a few days later, sometimes a week later. And so we had a massive growth win in the early days by just making that return process easier where as soon as they came back to finish the process, we put them in exactly the right place well, where they could pick up where they left off. Whereas before they were just, you know, dropped off on the homepage and, and tried to find their way back. So it's, it's simple things like that, thinking through, you know, all the, the friction that people have that could be very unusual friction. Like it's hard to get back to where they were before after dropping off. And by, by reducing that and by fixing those problems, you can get a lot of growth. Why don't you like the word, uh, why don't you like the phrase growth hacking? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think growth hacking implies that you're doing small things or, or you're using tricks uh, to get growth, right? Uh, but in reality, typically the biggest growth wins across all the companies I've been at have been pretty large ideas, you know, pretty significant changes, uh, over time, they weren't hacks. They were, you know, new features and new approaches um, to driving growth. Uh, and they came out of thinking deeply about how growth worked for that company and, and how we could accelerate it. So, so I think growth hacking really under, understates it and makes it seem like you're, you're just trying little tricks here and there and you're trying to find that next trick that will get you growth. And that's really not how it works. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, and sort of to, to that end, the bit, the big idea point, and these, these can be sort of fundamental strategies that get baked into a, really the DNA of a company and the DNA of a product that is to think about growth. And, and, and yet there's, there's also in parallel, not in contradiction, but there's 
of course, this idea of being super quantifiably oriented and right. metrics driven with respect to these different techniques. So you mentioned the the wealth front example of noticing that folks were not, you know, uh, were stopping their sign up halfway through. And if you could create a sort of resume a button, that would increase, you know, completion and how how profound of an impact that was. I love that example. But to to notice such a thing, right? You have to have in place, I assume, right, a set of systems that are tracking. Um, all sorts of user behavior. What, what sorts of dashboards and metrics do world-class startups put in place to try to understand where there might be low-hanging fruit to, to grow their, their products? Yeah, yeah. The key thing to do, I think, Ben, is not so much the dashboards and metrics, but having people on the team, uh, on the broader team within the company or on the growth team that actually care about getting to those kinds of insights that are going to dig deep in the data. You only get to dashboards and you only get to these strategies after a long period of actually doing sort of investigations and learning from experimentation and, and seeing what's important that you can then extract into a dashboard. You know, we didn't know that people were dropping off uh, from the Wellfront signup flow, you know, day one when I started. And no dashboard that you could put together would think of recording that little bit of information, right? It's just not a not a common thing to think about. Yeah, it's the unknown unknowns, right? You you wouldn't That's know right. it's a problem. Yeah. That's right. And so you have to dig, right? And you have to analyze every little step in the process. Uh, and you have to launch experiments and learn why did they work, why didn't they work. Right, So we actually launched an experiment. The way we learned about this, we launched an experiment that was completely unrelated. And it worked better than we expected, actually. And we looked into that and we said, oh, there's this population of users that we didn't even count on that this experiment was helping, which are these users that were returning to complete their sign-up flow. You know, in our estimation of what this experiment might do, we didn't think about that kind of user population. We didn't know they existed. We didn't know they were that massive. And that learning kind of got us on a set of new ideas that said, okay, what can we do for these returning users? This is a large population. Can we make it even better for them? Uh, and of course, that led to this win. So the most important thing is that you're, you're looking at everything. You have folks that are trying to get to the truth of what's happening with growth and how growth is working for the company and what the barriers to growth are. And then they're extracting these insights that eventually you can operationalize and you can extract into dashboards and you can see uh, you know, how many people dropped off this week and came back and how many of them were successful in doing that. Well, it is, it is an interesting uh, point regarding having people dedicated to this, this purpose. You were at LinkedIn, you were the first person to be sort of uniquely focused on growth. Is that right, Elliot? Yes, the company did focus on growth in the early days, uh, in, in the founding days, but at some point they stopped and started focusing on other things. Um, and so uh, I was fortunate to be able to kind of revive uh, and reassemble the growth efforts and, and have a team that was 100% focused on growth. Well, it, it's interesting because it kind of also reminds me of the, you know, the job title data science, j- data scientists and data science teams. Like there's some, some of these job titles are are new in the last yeah. 15, 20 years. Uh, it makes sense. Technology is, you know, is evolving, changing. And, um, you know, Chamath Paul Hapatia, who was on the podcast um, a few weeks ago talking about angel investing in SPACs, you know, part of his celebrated biography is helping uh, initiate the growth team at Facebook or being the first right. person to put in place that team. And so now all these companies have tons of people who are, you know, focused on growth. But at each company, there has to be someone to do it for the first time and actually put in place that team, right? That's right. That's right. And and now it's everywhere. And it's great to see that everyone has actually discovered the value uh, of, of product like growth. And so certainly every company I know in the Valley has folks thinking about it or, or a dedicated growth team. Let's talk about A-B testing. Um, I know this is an area of, of uh, expertise and passion for you, uh, yeah. perhaps because there's, there may be a lot of misconceptions. So first, tell us what is what is good A-B testing practices look like in a especially a consumer internet startup? And then uh, what misconceptions do folks have uh, when this topic comes up? Yeah, absolutely. And, and let me start with the biggest misconception. So the biggest misconception I've seen is thinking that A-B testing is about you know small changes or small ideas. 
And I actually traced this. I think there was an article, I forget the publication, it might have been Forbes or Fortune or something like that a long, long time ago. There was an article about Marissa Mayer at Google being presented with a design for a new product that used a particular blue color. And then her feedback was, well, why don't we test 100 shades of blue to find the right blue? for this product. Yeah, that is a legendary story. I've, I re- I've read that story too. It's, it's, it's memorable. <laughs> yes, yes. It's super memorable. And I can't tell you how many times I've run into folks in Silicon Valley that think that is an example of kind of modern A-B testing and experimentation, that you're testing 100 shades of blue or, you know, 50 shapes for your button, right? Or, or 20 colors of links or, or whatever it is. At, at least you didn't ask for... F- for testing 50 different shades of gray, because that would have been too on the nose. Right, right. Exactly. That's funny. But that actually is a, is a, is a pretty ridiculous example. Uh, you know, it might make sense for Google to test 100 shades of blue, because at Google scale, even a minor difference, you know, 0.1% difference uh, in something they care about because of a different shade of blue might make, might make a big difference, right, to the company. Uh, but in your typical organization, you know, even if you had the bandwidth and time and, and resources to test a hundred shades of blue, and one of them had a one percent, you know, one shade was one percent better than the shade you had originally chosen, or the average shade, it just doesn't make a difference, right? You've just spent a lot of resources and a lot of time for a very very small win, and so. Early in my LinkedIn days, I had to kind of negate this notion of what A-B testing was. Uh, and this leads to your first question, what's what's good A-B testing? What's a good experimentation process? A good experimentation process is using A-B testing or experimentation in general for two things. One, it's for learning, right? When you launch an experiment, whether it works or it doesn't, you should be learning something. You should be developing an insight into, oh, it didn't work. Why didn't it work, right? Oh, maybe this source of friction that we tried to remove uh, wasn't that big of a deal. Or maybe this page on which we added this placement, this promotion of a feature, maybe this page doesn't get enough traffic to move our metrics. Or even if it did work, oh, why did it work? Oh, people really like this. They resonate with this. Or, uh, you know, there was an untapped opportunity uh, in a particular segment of people. So the first thing you should be doing with experimentation is really learning. And you can't really learn much in that shade of blue experiment. You know, learning that a particular shade of blue might resonate a little better doesn't give you any insight about your your users and doesn't give you any follow-up. Well, what can you do with that? Nothing right? Make other things that shade of blue uh, is probably the best thing you can do. And then the second piece um, of great experimentation is risk management. You know, you might have an idea that you really love, that you're really excited about, that you really think is going to be great. But you know, the truth is you you never know for sure. And so by putting it out there as an experiment, as an A-B test, you get to confirm whether your intuition is correct and you get to manage the risk of maybe you're wrong, right? Maybe your idea is not the best improvement to the product. Or maybe it improves the product for some people, but actually makes it worse for others. All of that you can learn by making it an experiment, by making any idea, every idea uh, that you put out there an experiment rather than just pushing it out and hoping that it works. Uh, You know, I think it's a great reinforcement of the point you said earlier, which is, is becoming now a theme of this conversation, which, which is great, which is, you know, uh, look for big wins. Like the problem with growth hacking, you said as a phrase was it implies like sort of micro optimizations and, you know, small word changes. Uh, and here we're talking about the, the 50 shades of blue example, sort of be more ambitious and, yes. and, and maybe be more humble. Like you might be missing something really, really big. And I think that's a great takeaway for, for, all you know, PMs everywhere. Is there an example of a of a big insight that you arrived at, Elliot, in any of your experiences at the aforementioned companies, the ones we've been talking about, that came as a result of a sort of ambitious experiment, and maybe there's a surprise uh, finding at the end? Yeah, I mean, so many, and it's it's hard to even know where to start. But I'll, I'll try to give a few. So, you know, one that we faced at LinkedIn uh, was LinkedIn 
you know, from day one was an international product, right? People in all over the world were using it, but the product was only in English. And of course, everyone knows, right? And, you know, everyone knows here is in quotes. Everyone knows English is the language of business and LinkedIn is a professional network. Um, so there wasn't much thought about translating LinkedIn into other languages. And eventually we got it translated into, into a handful of languages just to try it out. You know, at significant expense, you know, a whole new process for localizing strings and all this kind of translators and vendors are a pretty big thing to try. Um, and there was, a, there was a consensus from almost everyone that it probably wouldn't do much. Well, guess what? Every country that launched the language on average, increase their growth 2x. And when you say that, so the, what you did was, it was the, it was the word LinkedIn, like that, that phrase translated into the local language. No, it was the entire website. Oh, oh the entire website. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's actually yeah. serving the entire product in the localized language. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So that's why it was such a big effort to undertake. There was a whole new team built to do it, uh, you know, without really, uh, kind of an, uh, uh, without really any evidence uh, that this would accelerate growth or this would help the company. And so it was a pretty big bet. But we learned very quickly that it would accelerate growth uh, in every country uh, where whose language we made the product available in. Uh, and so almost immediately now we could we could double down on that. We could say, okay, where are the next 10 languages, 20 languages, 40 languages that we can translate into that would give us accelerating growth. So that's a good one. Let me give you one from uh, from Instacart, uh, which is kind of fun. Instacart, uh, you know, is a grocery delivery business, and it's unusual for an online business in that it has an online component and an offline component, right? Every time you place an Instacart order, it's routed to an actual in-person shopper, right? That's going to fulfill your order, that's going to gather your items, and ultimately deliver them to you. Um, and so unlike LinkedIn and unlike Facebook and unlike many other services, you can't just turn on a particular geography uh, or a particular country or state and the product is, suddenly works. You actually need you know, partnerships with grocery retailers. You need shoppers on the ground in that geography that will actually fulfill orders. And that means that it's actually pretty expensive to launch a new geography that uh, and when I started at Instacart the company was very cautious about the geographies it launched uh, because it was expensive and you could see that expense and you didn't always see the growth benefit from that geography some geographies took off and some did not right when you launch there uh, and so a powerful insight uh, in those days through looking at the data and doing experimentation was was realizing that we could actually predict which geographies would be hits and which would not uh, and also that we could largely automate the process of launching that would make it less expensive and of course, that allowed us to to launch more aggressively and launch many more geographies and accelerate the company's growth. So, so, so explain that actually because it's it's fascinating. So, so Instacart says only serving San Francisco. Then the next question is, do we serve Pittsburgh or Chicago? What did the data insights unlock that make that decision more effective? Yeah, yeah. So as we were, uh, you know, experimenting on on growth for Instacart, we noticed an unusual phenomenon. We noticed a phenomenon where every time we launched a market, you know, say we launched Dallas, right, as, as, as an example, the geographic areas around Dallas suddenly started to become more aware of Instacart and were actually hitting our servers asking for the product, right, trying to get Instacart to work for them. And so through launching markets and kind of monitoring them closely and also experimenting in our, in our sign-up flows and collecting more information there, we found this interesting geographic effect that said markets adjacent to ones that we were already in were really, really promising because people wanted the product there, right? They were getting the benefit of the word of mouth uh, from uh, the adjacent market where Instacart already existed. 
Uh, and so that was a big insight. Yeah, uh, that's a big insight. And, and, it, and it, it might sound obvious when you say it, but of course, if, if you're thinking, if, you're con- if, if the choice is, okay, we're already in Dallas, we're already in San Francisco, should our next city be Chicago or, you know, uh, some suburb of Dallas? I, you're more likely to say, well, Chicago is the much bigger TAM. But in fact, um, sort of no name cities or second tier cities on the outskirts of the major cities would be the, it sounds like the, the, the higher ROI expansion path. That's right. That's right. So unusual insight because everyone thinks exactly like you described, well, what's the next city? Whereas the right answer is, how can we cover more of the concentric circles around Dallas until it stops working? right? Because we already have some infrastructure in place. So the suburb is actually easier than a brand new city. And there's already growing awareness there. We can already estimate demand. Um, and so, yeah, we, we literally converted the company strategy to this, to this model of, of full coverage of geographic areas where we might start in the Dallas city center, but then we would rapidly add every suburb and everything uh, in the surrounding area where, where it made sense. That's fantastic. Maybe zooming out a little bit, Elliot, um, and thinking about people you admire. I mean, you've, in your career, have had the opportunity to work with a lot of really talented entrepreneurs and executives and, and growth thinkers and doers. Within the field of product management specifically, although if you want to take a broader aperture, feel free, uh, who are the product leaders who you particularly admire? Maybe you know them personally, or maybe you only know them from afar. And, uh, and why? Yeah, yeah. So maybe an unusual answer, or at least unusual answer to this question. But, uh, you know, the person, the product leader I probably admire most is Jeff Wiener uh, from LinkedIn. Uh, You know, he was the CEO for a long time there. uh, And I think just stepped back earlier this year. Uh, It might be one of your LPs, uh, Ben. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) And so, you know, he's, he's known as a great CEO, as a great leader. He's not you know, as well known as a great product thinker, but he actually is. He was one of the people that that made LinkedIn successful by uh, coming in and having amazing product intuition uh, and kind of knowing what a good product is and what a bad product is and also being quantitative in his approach to product. You know, he wanted us to have dashboards and to have metrics and he asked us questions about them and review them, you know, every week and try to get every team to understand how their metrics were moving and why and how they could take their product to the next level. So without necessarily realizing it or, or being painted as such, he was a, you know, a data-driven product leader uh, at LinkedIn and that's what it, made it, him it, successful. It's a great point. And I think it is, um, knowing Jeff a little as well, I, I do think it's probably one of his the part of his personal brand that's most unknown by the the masses, which is just how extraordinarily data oriented of a CEO he was with respect to product and growth. I mean, I've heard stories from other execs at LinkedIn who would frequently note that, you know, these obscure sort of automated reports that get sent out, you know, at 12.01 AM about different sites and and product movements, you know, hours later, Jeff would have a detailed set of questions about, what would otherwise seem like obscure points of data. What do you think is the meta skill? Like, so the, you, you use the word intuition, Elliot, with regards to Jeff, and you also talked about his data orientation. And, uh, you know, I'd argue, I guess, great product leaders tend to have a bit of both. I mean, there is this sort of Steve Jobs-esque sort of vision about what something can be, irrespective of data. But then there's also an extraordinary discipline and evidence uh, sort of drive how does somebody develop that? I mean, are, are yeah. you born that way or can you, do you, do you have to become this more like numerically literate or, or statistically literate? I think you can develop it. And I think it's, it starts from this fundamental drive of, you know, being very curious about the truth behind things. Right. So a lot of folks that gravitate toward math or science, maybe in their, in their early education, tend to kind of like those disciplines because there's a kind of quest for, for truth. You're trying to figure out how something works, right? Uh, You're trying to figure out why things are the way they are. Uh, And so that kind of background pretty naturally translates into, into, you know, what I saw Jeff doing at LinkedIn, what I was doing at LinkedIn, which is 
you're trying to get to the truth of what makes this product work, right? It's not a scientific truth necessarily. It's not a mathematical proof of how it works, but it's, it's a very similar approach. So I think being exposed to that in your education, coming from that, that sort of more, more analytical background or, or having that curiosity for the truth really helps. Uh, and then you mentioned intuition, uh, and that can be developed too, you know, believe it or not. And I've helped many product managers throughout my career kind of develop their, I call it product sense. You know, how can you tell with pretty good accuracy, even before you have numbers, whether a product will work or not? right? Whether it will achieve the goals. And it turns out you can develop that by just trying many, many different kinds of products uh, and seeing what works and what doesn't work and and having this massive library in your head of of kind of patterns of how products might work and how successful products might work and being able to refer to that library and apply it to new situations. Uh, And that's what Jeff was able to do. Uh, That's what great product managers are able to do. You know, Jeff was able to recall anecdotes and and things from his time at Yahoo and say, well, we tried something similar to this and here's what happened. And I can apply that to this situation. Um, it, are you using a uh, clubhouse, Elliot? Or have uh, you used I, it? I just signed up. I haven't participated in anything. Yeah. Yet. It's, it's interesting just as the, you know, current consumer product phenomenon du jour. Uh, yes. it, like I, it, it, it's interesting to me. So many of these apps are, launched by you know awesome entrepreneurs these days and very few gain traction um yeah and it, it's just sort of inter- now of course clubhouse is a bona fide phenomenon but it'd be curious if you put that app in front of you know great product thinkers with great product sense to use your phrase how many of them would have predicted the kind of uptake that the app has gotten so quickly I, you know to be honest with you i think a lot of them would I haven't engaged with the app that much, but I, I've seen its onboarding flows and its growth flows and its notification strategy, right? Uh, you know, I think every Clubhouse user probably sees notifications in the app. They're incredibly compelling, right? Their I onboarding is really creative in the sense of using your your contact graph or your social graph to not just have you invite people to Clubhouse, but also to recognize when they're joining Clubhouse on their own and to kind of pull them in to being active users. Ben, ben Thompson at uh, Stratechery just the other day in a piece about Clubhouse referred to Clubhouse's use of address book data as especially aggressive or some some phrase to that effect. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was on the spectrum of of light to heavy use of address book data. It was on yes. heavy. And, and I'm not close enough to the... I know this is a this is at the nexus of sort of growth um, and onboarding as well as concerns around privacy and user consent. Um, but it is, Thompson was the first I've seen comment on that particular dimension of of Clubhouse's strategy. Yeah, well, I noticed it right away. It, it helped that, of course, I was the the guy using address book data back, back at LinkedIn uh, with my team. But yes, they they have definitely learned some of the best patterns, some of the most effective patterns of using address book data from products like LinkedIn, from products like Facebook, and they have taken it to a pretty high level. Um, and and there definitely are a few things they're doing, which you know I would say are, are certainly in the gray area of how you can use that. They're effective, and I don't think they're they're particularly offensive or disturbing. But you know, if you talk someone through exactly what's happening, I think some people would get a little bit of the queasy feeling of, hmm, I don't know if I want my data used that way. Okay, let's talk about uh, sort of in, in rapid fire succession. I'm going to take off uh, the names, Elliot, of four of your previous employers, eBay, LinkedIn, Wealthfront, and Instacart, and yeah. would love for you just to share one or two key lessons learned from that chapter of of, of your career. Uh, let's start with eBay. Yeah, so eBay was very fortunate to be there early in my career because at the time, at least it was an amazing foundation product management. Learn a lot about product management process, you know, using dashboards to monitor your business and products, you know, how to work with engineering and design. eBay was was pretty amazing at the time at, at sort of teaching you those things. I still actually remember eBay product manager training. Uh, and some of the anecdotes uh, from that experience because they were just so powerful and so useful throughout my career. 
in 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 what was the eBay product management philosophy like in a nutshell? Or what was that curriculum? Or, or was it just like the basics of how to do product specs? Or is there a particular like point of view that they had? No, it was actually all about, you know, there was some stuff on product specs, of course, but the 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 magic of the eBay training was all about cross-functional teamwork, right? Now everyone understands that product management is actually a team sport. There might be a product manager, but they're usually partnered with a design lead, an engineering lead, a data scientist these days, maybe a user research lead, and and together they're managing the product. eBay understood that from a very early time and actually tried to train you how to work in that scenario and how to get the best outcomes out of that team. Love it. Uh, LinkedIn. Well, LinkedIn, of course, everything I know about growth, (laughs) I learned at LinkedIn. That was just an absolutely foundational uh, place. And uh, like I mentioned, I, I felt like I learned a lot about management and leadership from Jeff. Uh, and that's that served me well throughout the rest of my career. Wealthfront. Wealthfront, yeah. Uh, it's pretty funny on a couple of levels. One, it taught me both how universal approaches to grow far, because Wealthfront is a very, very different product than LinkedIn, uh, you know, much harder to adopt, uh, you know, of uh, completely different outcomes. You have to pay fees to use it. It's not free. So it, it both taught me how universal uh, the growth strategies were because we were able to make a lot of things grow very quickly there, but also taught me how much, you know, you have to think about the growth, the unique growth engine of each company in order to really get it to grow faster. You can't just take your playbook from LinkedIn and apply it to Wellfront. You know, some things will work, but a lot of things you have to develop anew by really going deep on how does the Wellfront product work. I think that's the, it's one of the most important ideas actually, and I think in all like sort of philosophy and, and learning and growth in general, which is when you have an experience in life and you learn a lesson, to what extent is that lesson transferable and applicable to a new yeah. experience that you have. Yeah. And some things are indeed universal and transferable. There are some truths about life and business and so on. And then there are sometimes genuinely novel circumstances. And actually having had that prior experience can be debilitating if you try to over-rotate around this lesson in the new context. And there are lots of examples of that, of course, where people take old playbooks to new scenarios and it doesn't work. That's right. That's right. I think it's it's critical to try to extract the sort of first principles of your previous playbook, the sort of universal truths of your previous playbook, because those you can apply again and again. But the exact strategies and tactics, uh, you know, usually don't apply uh, the next time you're in a new place. And lastly, key lesson learned from Instacart. Yeah, Instacart, uh, you know, tremendous company, great place. It was it was it was my first company where machine learning was literally critical to Instacart's success. Uh, you know, when, when Instacart had a particularly tough problem and it's a logistics oriented company, a lot of optimizing where people go and which order they fulfill, you know, Instacart applied machine learning to solve those problems. And that gave it a lot of flexibility and a lot of power in how those problems were solved versus some more kind of traditional and more manual approaches. Um, and so it was, it was my first experience kind of seeing that in action and seeing the power of just saying we have a hard problem, let's just have the machine learn how to solve it. So you left Instacart, what, a couple of years ago? Yep. And you ultimately decided to start another company. Talk us through the ideation process of coming up with different ideas, thinking about different things that might be interesting to you, you could be passionate about, as well as trying to actually solve a real problem in the world. And then right. through that process or through the journey of, through the idea maze, how did you end up deciding to co-found Anomalo? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my first step was actually not so much ideation. It, it was finding my co-founder. All right. I, I realized that the startup journey can be a very lonely one. Uh, and so what, what makes it work is working with people that you really like and that you respect. And so my first step was actually getting together with Jeremy, who's my co-founder now. We met at Instacart and he left a few months before me. And, uh, and just to know, pause for a sec, Elliot, just to yeah. jump in, because I think this is, a, this is such a fascinating pivot point in every entrepreneurial journey or juncture point rather. And we talk to our founders all the time about this, which is sometimes 
people start by assembling a team. You know, they, they have the sort of, they have sort of the overall aspiration or the general aspiration of I'm going to start a company. I'm not sure what type of company that's step one. That's just sort of declaring that having that self-knowledge. And then step two is I'm going to find a co-founder again, without having been attached to an idea. And then me and that co-founder or co-founders together are going to come up with an idea. And that path can certainly work. And it's the path you were on and want to hear exactly more how it unfolded, but just to just also underscore, it's also possible. There are plenty of successful companies that get started where there's, a single man or woman who decides they want to start a company conceives, you know, 80% or 90% of an idea. And then once that idea is conceived, goes and finds a couple of co-founders who are become genuine co-founders and genuinely co-authoring of the, of the mission. Uh, and then they, and they pr- pursue from, they go from there. And I think part of the, for younger founders who may not have as much a track record as you, Elliot, it can be difficult to recruit amazing co-founders when the idea is not really defined right if 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 your if your perspective is i just want to start a company hey do you want to start a company with me and you haven't done very much in your career it's going to be hard to get a world-class co-founder and so we tend to see people who are earlier in their career tend to actually have to have some shape around an idea to successfully close a co-founder whereas folks who are more seasoned or or have more credibility in in whatever way that shows up are able to actually get somebody to leave their job or to to pledge their allegiance to just the the yet undefined new company idea. Yeah, no, of course that makes total sense. I think, you know, I was fortunate to both be be late in my career and have that reputation and also one thing you build up through your career is a network of people, right? So you have kind of lots of people that you can call uh so to speak to, to join you. Uh, on your quest, which I realize not everyone uh, has available. Indeed. So you connected with Jeremy and the two of you said, we're going to start a company together. Well, we, we agreed to brainstorm ideas, right? Uh, you know, and again, we, we kind of probably had a hybrid of these two processes that you described where um, we wanted to work together. We didn't know on what, but we, we knew that we wanted an idea that we were both excited about. And so the ideation process wasn't so much an ideation process as a, as a kind of, you know, synthesis process because I had maintained throughout my career, I had actually maintained a list of startup ideas. Uh, I still have a Trello uh, somewhere that has, uh, you know, my list of startup ideas. Every time I would encounter a problem or, or uh, an issue in the workplace or a consumer product, I would just write it down. And so and Jeremy had maintained a similar uh, list of his own. And so we agreed to just bring our two lists together and see uh, if there were things that resonated. Uh, and we ended up having kind of multiple sessions uh, where we went through our lists and talked through each idea on our lists. And, and we ended up with a couple uh, that we were both genuinely excited by. And, and how did you... Um arrive at the the winning idea and and then describe you know give us the pitch for what it is and how it can be of service to uh to companies everywhere yeah absolutely so how do we arrive at the winning idea is we we took our top two ideas and we just started talking to people about them uh you know we started talking people to our network we knew that no matter what we we started out with no matter which idea we built you know we were going to have to go to our network to get people to use it to give us feedback so it was likely best to start it with an idea that our network already was receptive to, right? because that was going to make it easier to take the next step. And so we talked to a bunch of folks, and, and that's how we came up with the idea for Anomalo. And what Anomalo does is it helps you trust your data as an organization. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier in this conversation about how important it is to watch your data and understand what's going on with your product and business, especially in areas like growth. And it turns out that in this kind of modern cloud world that we're in today, every company is gathering massive amounts of data from all kinds of sources and is trying to use that data to make decisions, uh, to optimize their product, to get growth, to figure out which market to launch next. But one of the most annoying parts of actually trying to use data within organizations is that often the data is wrong. It's incomplete or it's missing things that should be there or it's out of date. It hasn't been updated Uh, or 
it was great data up until yesterday when some bad code shipped and now it's missing certain pieces. By the way, Elliot, as you're talking, it reminds me of that line. Uh, what is it? Uh, it's not the things you don't know that, that hurts you. It's the things you think you know that just ain't so. That's right. That's right. It's, it's, exactly it's, right. It, it's like in some sense, having no data and having to be honest about that fact can be uh, better than having data that's misleading. That's right. And and very often folks don't know that their data is wrong or misleading or missing or stale or corrupted. Uh, you know, I even had an example in my Instacart days when we had a whole team that was making decisions off a table that hadn't been updated in six months. Uh, and they didn't know, right? They would run their query against their table and they would get an answer and they would go and follow that answer. <laughs> and they, they didn't know that that table was out of date. And so they weren't getting the best answer uh, for their questions. Uh, and so Anomalo basically helps you avoid all those situations by automatically monitoring your data and letting you know when something goes wrong, when your data is out of date, when it's corrupted in some way, when something that was there before is missing. We automatically let you know, and then you can, with that full knowledge, choose to not use bad data uh, to make your decisions. And as a result, you can trust your data more. What types of companies should be using Anomalo and uh, where can folks learn more? So they can learn more at our website, Anomalo.com. That's A-N-O-M-A-L-O.com. And any company that cares about data and is using data to make decisions or is using data to power machine learning models and recommendations uh, would find a lot of use. Uh, from Anomalo. Uh, you know, companies in the e-commerce space use Anomalo quite a bit, but also anyone who's, you know, using data to make decisions and, and drive their product. LH Muckler, really appreciate your time today. Uh, delighted to have you in the Village Global Portfolio. Thank you for sharing uh, so many wonderful insights about product management and A-B testing and lessons learned from uh, such an illustrious career. Thank you for the time and the insights and for everyone listening. If you want to learn more about Anomalo, you can check out the Anomalo website or reach out to us at Village. We're happy to make the introduction directly to Elliot. Elliot, thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.